Now I answer a question about what if some co-workers in a church are not following God? Should we get angry at them and yell at them? What I want to say is yelling at people will not easily change people. Actually, it turns more people to be more angry and turn them against us. So I don't think anger is the best way. But rather we can listen to them and discuss with them. I've heard this certain problem. Uh, for instance, this person is not doing something following God's way. And I heard this. Can you tell me um, something about it? Now instead of, because we're going to say, can you tell me what's wrong with it? Then uh, already, whenever we say that's wrong, it caused the person to be against us. But we just say, I heard about this. Can you tell me something about it? This is neutral, right? Tell me something about it. And then the person says, it's right. It's right that I do it. Okay, and then I would say, that puzzles me. Because I saw in the Bible, it tells us not to do that. Can you explain from the Bible why that can be done? You know, so that's one way to guide them, to lead them to discuss. And then we can also say this. Uh, now, if he arrives, he agrees that, okay, this is wrong, but I cannot control myself, or I just want to do it. Then we can guide them to understand this. You know, when we serve God, the, there, there are many Bible verses that talk about that. God is the one who examines our hearts. He sees our heart and it will reward, reward us according to what we do. So what we do will be one day revealed to all people. And then, do you think God is happy with that? And then if we are serving God at the same time we have fornication or anger or hurting people or laziness or, or, uh, or greed for money, all these is it going to destroy? So we discuss with them. Is it going to affect? And we can also do the teaching. If we are teaching the whole church, we can teach this concept too. So people can understand, yes, when we commit these sins, then it's like you try to build a wall, at the same time you tear it down. Are there people like that? You build a wall and then you tear it down? After you build it, you don't. Because if we serve God, at the same time we have greed for money, that means we're not trusting in God and also we are getting money that we should not get. So whatever it is, that it causes problem. Now if the people insist that, well, we, we insist you are right, we continue to do this, that I think is for you to consider whether you will stay in the church. If a church says, okay, that's how we are, we commit adultery, we do all these things, then it's for us to decide whether we want to stay in the church. I don't want to stay in a church like that. Now for me, for my ministry, I don't want to agree or cooperate with anyone who is not following God. It's wasting my time. If the person listens to me, it's fine. But even if he listens to me, but if I find the person doesn't have good spiritual life, I will not cooperate with that person. But you might think, well, uh, and my level is very hard. I want to say that trust in God's provision, that your faith in God, that God can provide for you, that you can do ministry somewhere else or you start your own ministry instead of doing ministry with some people who continue to sin. It will destroy the ministry. Okay? The next question I'm going to answer is, there are some questions, no matter what you do, they're always lazy. They don't come to church regularly. I have a lot of things in my life. Okay, now for Christians like that, we have to have, first we want to listen. Don't try to change first because they are already like that. Their life is like that. If we just keep teaching them, they will just reject us. So we listen to them. What is the difficulty? And also listen to them, ask them, what do you think about God? Now if he says, God is good, but I'm just not good enough. Or God is good, but I'm too lazy. Whatever he says about God being good, I hold on to that. Yeah. So God is good. Now do you believe God is in control of everything? So these are some questions I ask people. 
Do you believe God is good? Second, do you believe God has everything in His hand? You know, Psalm 24, 1. The, the, the earth belongs to the Lord and everything that is in it belongs to the Lord. So our life and every possession, everything. Do you believe that everything belongs to the Lord? And and then also when Pontius Pilate tried to try Jesus, judge Jesus, he said, why don't you answer my question? Do you know that I have the authority to set you free or to crucify you? And Jesus said, if not for the authority given to you from above, you cannot do it to me. You can do nothing to me. So Jesus believed that only God has authority. Even when he was being persecuted, arrested, he still believed in the authority of God. So we can say that, do you believe that? God is in control of everything. Now, if he doesn't believe that, then we want to guide him to understand God is good and God can help you in your problems. God can help you with your family problem, your children problem, your finance problem. And then God has everything in his hand. And when you follow God, he can bless you. Now, of course, we need to have the testimony ourselves. Of course, I would say no one have too much money. You know, everyone can use more money. We don't have to have too much money to show to people God is blessing me. But at least we can show people that, that my life is following God and God is blessing me, guiding me. So we will tell people, do you believe that? Ask people, do you believe that? God is good and God has everything in His hand and no one can run away from Him. So if that's the case, do you want to follow God more? And then He says, I want to but I have no strength. And then we can say, okay, I pray for you. Do you feel more motivation? Yes, that's good. So keep that anointing. Keep praying so you keep the anointing of God. You have more motivation. And then when you read the Bible and pray, do you feel strength? Do you have strength? Yes, you have strength. So you have strength. So keep that. So we use their positive belief and positive experience to build them up. For anyone, it's like that. Whatever is good about them, pay attention to those things, talk about those things, and try to build up the positive things about the person. But also I want to say this, there are people who is like, you know, the parables of Jesus about the sower. There are people who like the hard ground or the shallow ground. There are people, they just have no heart for God. But we still help them. But after a while, even they know God is real and they know sin is bad and destroy their life, they still keep sinning. We help them. But we don't put all effort on them. We put the effort on the people who respond. I tell you, I keep helping people. There are people who are lazy, don't respond. But I keep helping and some of them turn back. Recently, in my church in Hong Kong, there was a girl who had problematic relationship with a guy. And she had emotional problem. It seems that everything is so difficult. And at that time, she did not want to give up the guy. But I guide her to understand God's grace and blessings and let her see what God is doing in her life and let her have this understanding. And then, at the same time, God spoke to her in a dream. God spoke to her to repent and turn away from that guy. And then she repented. And then she started to have good testimonies. And also, she start to hear more from God. So that motivates her. Another, another girl, she's bothered by emotions. Always negative, don't know motivation. And then she said, I just want to go to a church near my home and just go to sit in a service and go home. I don't want to come anymore because, and now, I, I told her, whatever church you go to is your choice. It's okay if you want to go to that church. If that church helps you, but because I know that the church has not helped her, and because when she goes to that church, she just wants to sit there. But I told her, God wants not only that you come to a church, but you, your life is changed, your life is raised up, so that you can serve God, so that one day you have to face God too. I told her about the fruit of salvation. Remember, yesterday the sixth important fruit continue to uh, repent, continue trusting God, have a good relationship with God, love God, and obey God and serve God. And I asked her, do you have these fruits? One day when you see God, God will ask you. And then she said, I guess I don't. 
I guess I will come back. Now, I, when people really constantly in the church and good in, you know, getting help in the church, I would never ask them. But this person has come to our church for a while. But she said, now I want to go to another church that's closer to my home and just sit in the service and then go home. I just want to be a Christian like that. So I asked her, do you have this fruit? And one day you face God too. <coughs> I told her the grace of God, but I also told her the law. You have to face God. But I did not yell at her. I did not yell at her. I was patient with her. And she said to me, I thank you for your patience. You're very patient with me. So that's finally changed her. So also we cannot do all this. We have to train people to do that. Not if it's just the preacher who does it, you cannot do too much. We have to train people to do it. Okay. Any question related to this to raise up people's spiritual life? And there are many different ways to raise up people's spiritual life. First, we let people know how good God is. And, and when I'm teaching, people see how good God is. And also we pray for them. I, I lay it on everyone in the church so they understand and experience the work of the Holy Spirit. They, they hunger for God and they see that God is good. And then when people have good testimonies, I ask them to come and share, to share how God works in their life and so that motivates people. And also I train people to serve God. So these people also spread the word to other people. So all this added together. And the teaching also, my teaching is down to earth. I don't just preach about stealing while most people don't steal. I don't preach about beating people up. Most people don't pre beat people up. But if there are people who beat people up, then we can preach about that. I preach about laziness, lukewarmness, no concern for God, no heart for God, thinking that they can run away from God, that they are smarter than God. So I want to preach down to earth the real problems of the people. And then at the same time, let them know how good God is and God wants to bless you. Do you want the blessings of God? And so I motivate them in all different ways. Yes, you want to ask something? Yeah, I want to ask a question. Yeah, my question now, if you have a question, come quickly to the front. Yes. Yeah, my question is, uh, in some churches, they have uh, what you call sinner's bench. That's to say, <laughs> if you do something, even though you go to church every day, every day, but now if you do something outside the, the, the Christian faith, right? They disfellowship you. So when you come to church, maybe they have that of their bench behind there. When you come to church, you don't ask questions, and you don't raise stone, and you don't do anything. You get sit down and listen to God for after you say amen and you go. S communication. So, yeah, so how S communication. So you can S communicate you. Okay, okay. Yes. Okay. Well, I think part of it is a good idea. The sinner's bench is a good idea. So that the people who are in serious sins can still hear the word of God. But I would include that they can also ask questions, but not to disturb other people. That they can ask questions how to follow God again. I, I, that, I would, that part I would include. But it's a good idea that people are excommunicated, but they can still come to hear the message. I think it's a good idea. Okay? Yes. Now, if you have a question, come quickly to the front. Come quickly, everyone. Say all the questions. If you put a, a believer now on a bench and he died, what is the punishment? What is the punishment? <laughs> yeah, well, he sinned. So he was if, this, yeah. if the church, I mean, the pastor put a sinner on a bench, okay. God forgive him. He died. He died. He died. He died. Okay, let me say this. Christians who have sins and don't con confess the sin and don't repent, there is a danger of losing salvation. But we cannot tell sometimes because the person might have repentance inside. Of course, the best is that he's repentant and he tells other people, repent of the sins. But there are people who repent inside. Them. And then if they have so long as they have repentance and also they have a relationship with God, they can still be saved. But so we cannot judge that. We cannot judge you. But generally, if they have sins and they don't confess, they don't repent, generally they will go to hell. Generally. Okay. Now, quickly, quickly. Uh, Please, can you explain to us the difference between apostates? 
apostate and a backslider. And what will happen to them if they die in that situation? Now, this are, these are two terms that, now backsliding, generally people say Christians are weak. And, uh, but some of them actually have lost their salvation. To me, the term doesn't matter. The key thing is whether he still has the Holy Spirit inside. Whether he obeys the, obeys the Holy Spirit. If he doesn't obey the Holy Spirit, he has no salvation. He, if he doesn't respond to the Holy Spirit, he has no salvation. So it must be people who have the voice of the Holy Spirit inside and respond to the voice in some ways, at least in some ways, before he has this connection with God, then he's saved. So the term doesn't matter. In Jesus' name. Uh, really, the uh, same thing very bothering and I want to know whether it is necessary for a church to discipline a married man if fond of the married woman. It is necessary because most often in some churches, if I marry a girl today and then they get they respect me at home and then if they bring the news to the church, the pastor will discipline me where if one of the members it is necessary to put out. To beat me, no, I mean. What did he say? He said, is it good for a pastor to beat upon a married man in the church? Yeah. Beat a married man in the church? Yeah. Why? The discipline of a married man is a discipline. Because he had a uh, problem in the relationship. Well, that's, that's a custom I never heard of before. But I think it's not wrong if the church agrees that this person you know has done something serious that some punishment be given to him i think it's okay but in some countries they might forbid that beating but then there could be some other punishment i think it's okay you know <laughs> there is some customs they follow it's not followed anywhere else it's kind of different and so it's there is no absolute answer to those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, question come up. Uh, for me, I really want to understand if it is possible for a man of God to marry before he start preaching the gospel. Say it again. To marry again and preach the gospel? No. To marry he said, before. He said, is it right for a pastor uh, to get married before, to get to married before he begins to preach the gospel? That's no problem. I mean, getting married has nothing to do with preaching the gospel. He, he can be a single man to preach the gospel. He can be a married man to preach the gospel. That has nothing to do with it. But so long as the marriage is, you know, is right in front of God. Thank you. Uh, since I heard you talk about the danger of a Christian losing his salvation, what is your view regarding this doctrine of predestination? At one save and save forever. Okay. Let me tell you, I agree with predestination, but I don't agree with one save, always save. The point is, about one save, always save, the idea is like this. Because the Bible does talk about the elect cannot lose their salvation. The point is, who are the elect? But then, John Calvin said that the elect are those anyone who has believed once. Who has believed once and then you are the elect. But the Bible does talk about people who have left, you know, and the Bible warns against that. I have Bible verses about that. That warn against that and says that there are some people and the last day who have forsake the truth. There are many verses like that. Even the, the sower's parable talk about that there are people who are saved like a shallow soil and then saved and then lose salvation. The point is they think that the ones who are saved once are the elect. To me, it's the one who, are, who continue to have relationship with God, then they are the elect, not the ones saved. So the Bible does speak against that, that there are some people who are saved uh, for once and then they can lose salvation. Now the John Calvin idea is like this. First assumption, God's will is the most high. And the point is, when God says someone is saved, his person is saved. That's true. The Bible does talk about that predestined. But actually, it's God 
rule, his will is the highest. John Calvin said, his rule, his will is the highest. But for John, uh, Martin Luther, God's love and grace is the highest, not his absolute rule. And then the point is, he chose people to be saved, that's true. And then he worked on these people. But the Bible also says it is possible to lose salvation. And also, people who are saved are not necessarily, once, once saved, not necessarily always saved. We have seen many examples of that. Even people who are really converted, mm. their life is really changed, but they can still lose salvation. salvation. So, that teaching, and also it gives some false security to some people. They say, I was saved once, so I will not lose salvation. That the Bible never used that as a security. That when you look at Matthew 7, 21, it says, Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And then also in Matthew 25, the parable of the talents and parable of the sheep and the goats, it's all that the Bible verses, the Bible tells us that judgment is according to deeds. We are saved by grace through faith. But the deeds prove whether the person is saved or not. We're not saved by good works. But all the judgment passage you say, you look over the whole Bible. There is no judgment passage like this. The person comes in front of the throne of God and the God asks, do you believe? Yes, I believe. Okay, go to heaven. The Bible is not like that. It's always judged according to the deeds. And by the words and by the deeds. And whether they have served God, they have obeyed God, it shows that they are saved. And then the thief crucified next to Jesus, his life, even though he didn't have much time to glorify God, but he did glorify God on the cross. That because he said, he has done nothing wrong, but we have done something wrong. And remember me when your kingdom come. This is a public uh, confession and his trust in Jesus. So this is his fruit. Okay. And um, there are people who look at Matthew 25 and they don't say that these are people who lost salvation. Because it does say that these people, they will cast out into the darkness and they will gnash teeth and then they will um, be thrown into eternal punishment. Okay. So John Calvin used a theory. It's a theory. He has many passages. He saw that people can lose salvation, but he used a theory. God is absolute. His rule is absolute. His will is absolute. So he decides someone to be saved, he must be saved. And then so he said, once saved, he must be saved. He didn't realize that there could be people who are once saved. Once saved doesn't mean elect by God. 